Prahlad Maharaj was asked by his father, what's the best thing that you've learned in school? Should I ask for a volunteer or should I say? What was his reply? Those who have accepted a material body, Dehinam, I, and those who accept the material body to be themselves and the extensions of the body to be mine, I and mine, Asat Grahat. Remember that one? Asat Grahat. <laughs> Samud Vigna Diyam. Their intelligence is filled with anxieties. And that person <coughs> should, um, they're like an individual that fell in a dark well on the kupam where there's no water and only misery. Such a person should go to the forest in Prabhupada's gloss, specifically Vrindavan, where Krishna consciousness is prevalent, and worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now the other instruction that we began hearing is a continuation of that. The audience is different. It's the teachers, Shanda and Amarka, and like their father, like Prahlad's father, they were also more than curious. They wanted to know where, how, what, how did you become an agent of the enemy? Friends and enemies. And how did your intelligence become polluted? So now comes the next teaching. Those who see friends and enemies, it's the result of what he said to his father. They've accepted a body and the body is themselves and the extensions of the body is theirs. I and mine. Asat grahat. So then you're in this realm of duality and those that are in this realm of duality see friends and enemies. Us and them, I and mine. And then there's people that are somebody else's and somebody else's. But then we, we heard about the Anupashataha and Pandita Samadarshana and seeing with a spiritual conception doesn't mean we can't see differences on the material platform or even the spiritual platform. But the spiritual conception is you see that which is spiritual as spiritual. But if you don't see that, you'll see the temporary as all in all. And now we're going to hear what else happens. And let us just invoke our remembrance one more time, probably a few more times as we go along. These are specially appreciated teachings within the, the whole of Srimad Bhagavatam that teach the mood and the way of pure devotion. For those of us that are not yet pure devotees, these are very valuable instructions. As we said so many times this morning, Small, but really big. So it needs to go in, not just we give the answer on a quiz question and we get an A in our exam, but we really don't live our life that way. So it's how to live your life and how to become a pure devotee. And so he's saying these things very directly to those who are calling Vishnu an enemy. And then by inference, he's also an enemy because he's a devotee of Vishnu. They're not yet saying you're the enemy, 
but Vishnu is the enemy. And those that see friends and enemies see souls on the friend and enemy platform too. <clears throat> so here's the Sanskrit of the next text, and I made it color-coded to make it a little easier to um, take apart. This sva para, sva para iti, just leaving out the iti part, sva para, and the word for word is, this is my business and somebody else has their business. That's how Prabhupada is given in the, what he's given in the word for word. In the verse, it's thinking of in terms of enemy and friend. Because I and mine is my business, your business, my, you're my friend, you're not my friend. You're my friend if you help me with my business. Just like this definition that we're asked about what is, what's, how do you break down friend and enemy. Somebody that interferes with my sense gratification, that's an enemy. Somebody that interferes with my happiness, that's an enemy. Somebody that interferes with my business, that's an enemy. And you have bigger enemies and smaller enemies and medium enemies, and it can even be a family member. It's like an enemy because you're interfering with my sense gratification. What's my happiness? Mine. Asat grahat. Connecting back to that first teaching. Then, <clears throat> atma, atma, abudhir. Here's this word buddhi again, and buddhi and abuti. So, abuti is without intelligence, or Prabhupada's translation, unable to ascertain atma. So, he's translated it as super soul. It could be the individual soul. You can't see the individual soul, you can't see the super soul when your intelligence is in this friends and enemy position. When you're in duality, you can't see spirit. That which is spirit, you see otherwise. You see scripture otherwise, you see the deity otherwise, you see the holy name otherwise, you see souls otherwise. You see the, that which is in this world that's spiritual as material. Duality. By default. Just this one little thing. Get a material body and identify with it. We all got one. And are all, to different degrees, identifying with it. That's, you know, so it's how to go from the contaminated to the pure state. He's giving teachings for us by teaching Shanda Namarka, in this case. And then this other line that's in a light blue color, Muyanti, bewildered. Right in the first verse, muyanti at surayaha. The, even the, the demigods, first verse of the Bhagavatam, even the demigods are bewildered. It's right in this verse too. Even Lord Brahma can be bewildered, but bewildered about following the principles of devotional service. Muyanti at <coughs> vartmani veda vadino. Veda Vadino. Veda Vada or Veda Vit. They're, they can't discern what devotional service really is. Muyanti. They don't understand devotional service. They don't understand Atma. They don't understand Paramatma. Theirs is the world of duality. Now, the final little translation is that Prahlad is not seeing like that, and that has because, is because of the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which he acquired through the mercy of Narada. Hint, that's how we can acquire going beyond this duality business, material existence, material consciousness business. By mercy, 
properly received. Same thing as we discussed this morning. So here's the translation of text 13. Persons who always think in terms of enemy and friend are unable to ascertain the super soul within themselves. Not to speak of them, even such exalted persons as Lord Brahma, who are fully conversant in the Vedic literature, are sometimes bewildered in following the principles of devotional service. So, my dear devotees, if Brahma can be sometimes bewildered, what to speak of us? And the problem is not outside of us. Now, speaking of himself, the same Supreme Personality of Godhead who bewilders that group of people has created this situation. Who has created the situation has certainly given me the intelligence to take the side of your so-called enemy. So they wanted to know, were you getting this? From the same place you're getting yours. Same answer he gave to his father. How are you getting your power? Same place you are, Dad. Vishnu. He's saying the same thing. To where are you getting? From the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, he doesn't say Narada gave that benediction, but that's the source. Prabhupada's explanation in the purport is very sweet. My dear teachers, you wrongly think that Lord Vishnu is your enemy, but because he is favorable toward me, I understand that he is the friend of everyone, including you. You may think that I have taken the side of your enemy, but factually, he has bestowed a great favor upon me. So, that's the friend and enemy consciousness. You've got this polluted consciousness. You've got this polluted conception. You've been spoiled. You're on the side of the enemy. But the, the reality, the spiritual reality is a favor has, he has removed that illusion by the grace of Narada. He has removed that illusion because it's his maya. This is um, in Queen Kunti's prayers. When she, excuse me, Devahuti to Kardamamuni. Devahuti to Kapila Dev. There we go. Devahuti to Kapila Dev. I'm, I'm in illusion. I'm thinking in terms of the bodily conception of life and family and attachment and all kinds of anxiety connected to that. And I know, I know the philosophy, it's only maya. But it's your maya. You put it there. You can remove it. Please remove it. And he does so through instructions, and it gets removed. Because it's not just a magic wand, touch the magic wand, and maya's gone. There's a relationship of hearing and then acting within what you've heard to connect with the source of what you're hearing the personality of Godhead, ultimately. So he is, same as we heard, same super soul who puts the illusion person into illusion, the same super soul has given his favor to me. You consider him an enemy. I consider him very dear to me. And so he's given me this intelligence, and he's given you another kind, the friends and enemy intelligence. Then he uses this nice metaphor of a magnet and iron filings, or a magnet and iron. Oh, Brahmanas, as iron attracted by a magnet stone moves automatically toward the magnet, my consciousness, having been changed by his will, is attracted by Lord Vishnu, who carries a disc in his hand, thus I have no independence. Oh, I, I'm spontaneous. You want to know how this come? 
I'm spontaneously attracted. Just like magnet and iron. And it's perfectly natural. We're going to hear more about that also. Perfectly natural for iron or iron filings to be attracted to a magnet. They don't have to think about it. Well, let me think about it. They're attracted to the magnet. And similarly, for living entities to be attracted toward Krishna is natural. Not unnatural. The other is totally unnatural. It's a diseased condition. To have a fever is unnatural. To have normal temperature, that's natural. So the feverish condition of material existence has a natural solution. Bring your temperature to a normal. <laughs> Whatever is aggravating the body to the cause of fever, remove the aggravation and it becomes normal. It's normal, natural. We'll hear some more. Krishna, Prabhupada explains, Krishna means he who attracts everyone and everything. And he goes on to say, this natural attraction finds its perfection in Vrindavan. The flowers and fruits in the gardens, they're attracted to Krishna. The waves of the Jamuna River are attracted to Krishna. And the land, the sky, the trees, plants, animals, everything attracted by Krishna. And then we have the duality position where people don't have to get trained up to be attracted to sense gratification or that which seems to be able to purchase sense gratification. It's just part of the I and mine program. We're getting like a little anatomy class. Anatomy of material consciousness. Just contrary to the affairs of Vrindavan is the material world where no one is attracted by Krishna and everyone Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Everyone's attracted by maya. And what does maya mean? Illusion. And we're attracted by illusion. That's why we came here. Because we're attracted by illusion, so we're given illusion. And we're chasing after it. Good image. And Prabhupada very kindly speaks about the compassion of Prahlad this Hiranyakashipu situation. Hiranyakashipu, his name means sense gratification. <coughs> Gold and soft bedding. Kashipu. So he's, um, you know, a big version and there's smaller versions. Tiny Hiranyakashipu, as Prabhupada says. But attracted by women and money. And because that's an unnatural attraction, then their attraction for Krishna is absent. So, thus, purification is needed. So, the purification is coming. We'll hear it multiple times. It's particularly strong with his classmates. Now, he, remember, he's speaking to his teachers. But this material attraction needs to subside before you, the spiritual attraction can prevail. The clouds have to be moved before the brilliance and heat and light of the sun can shine through, although it's already shining. So some effort and some prayer, and you know, an artanavritti has to happen before Shuddha Bhakti can happen. So he's giving knowledge to don't take shelter of the temporary. This is part of the teachings of pure bhakti, that pr it's the whole section. Consciously, knowingly. Now, the bhakti process helps us, but there must also be some conscious, knowing, sincere efforts in those directions. We make some effort in Krishna's mercy. Combination. And Prabhupada speaks of the ultimate purification, 
purification of Hiranyakashipu from money and women, and the ultimate purification is becoming free from all material contamination and all material de de designations. And then attraction to Krishna becomes stronger, stronger, stronger. We're not there yet, but the aspiration is important. The bhakti process, it does both at once. The material attraction uh, is cleansed. Cheta darpana marginum, bhava maha da vagni nirvapanam. Then, shreya kairva chandrika vidharanam, vidya vadhu jivanam. So, the bhakti process does both. It de de decreases the fever of material existence and increases the natural condition, the, ultimately the natural attraction for Krishna. This dvandava moha, Prabhupada makes reference to this verse in his purport. The duality of delusion subsides when one is situated in devotional service. And certainly something that helps devotional service is to be freed from sinful activity and to be engaged in proper activity. But that's not the essence. The essence is the bhakti principle. And when the bhakti principle is invoked, then the duality of delusion subsides. See, he's teaching to become fully Krishna conscious. And how does one become fully Krishna conscious? We have contaminations. Contaminations need to be cleansed. Um... Anya abhilashata shunyam. Abhilas means desire. Anya abhilas means other desires. In shunyam, we know what that means. Buddhism. <laughs> means completely gone. Zero. Zip. Gone. Anya abhilash shunya. It's not at once, it's gradual. But that's the becoming Krishna conscious platform. So he's now given that reply. How, where, how did you get this contaminant? This is to Shandanamarka. This is teaching number two. And we're going to quickly touch on teaching number three. He again goes back to Hiranyakashipu. So there's a series of verses where Shanda and Amarka are enraged by hearing. Prahlad speaking. They haven't given up their friend enemy picture of what's in front of them. Their student, Prahlad. And so they conclude we have to use measure number four. It, they make reference to what they were trying to teach Prahlad is, you know, to rule. There's this and that and the other. And the, the last one is, you get a stick and you whack somebody. So, they decided they were going to whack him until he submitted and gave up this polluted intelligence. Doesn't say whether they whacked him or not, but that was their mindset, just like, Intimidate him like anything. And they tried and they tried and they tried and some time passed. And then after some time passed, Hrnani Kashipu once again invited Prahlad to sit on his lap. And he's affectionate Hrnani Kashipu. He um, wanted to hear what Prahlad had learned since the last time he asked that question. <laughs> My dear son, oh, long-lived one, how much time, for so much time you have heard many things from your teachers. Now, please repeat to me whatever you think is the best of that knowledge. Uh, 
Hirani Kashipu shouldn't have asked this question because he gets an answer, he, he flips. Of course, Prahlad, having heard from Narada within the womb, is thinking of Narada's wonderful instructions, which he fully embraces. And so he repeats what he heard from Narada Muni, his spiritual master. And he recites the processes of bhakti. Shavanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam padasevanam marchanam bandhanam dasyam sakyam atmani vedanam that's the best thing I've learned. Devotional service to Vishnu, who Prahlad knows very well. His father thinks Vishnu is the enemy. The best thing he knows is devotional service to Vishnu is the best thing he knows. He knows it's going to irritate Dad. <laughs> but he doesn't hesitate to say it. Consequences included. Now, Hearing and chanting about the transcendental holy name, form, qualities, paraphernalia, and pastimes of Lord Vishnu, remembering them, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, offering the Lord respectful worship with 16 types of paraphernalia, offering prayers to the Lord, becoming a servant, considering the Lord one's best friend, and surrendering everything unto him. In other words, serving him with body, mind, and words. These nine processes are accepted as pure devotional service when it was dedicated his life to the service of Krishna. So these nine methods should be understood to be the most learned person. For he has acquired complete knowledge. And, of course, it's one of the longest purports in the Bhagavatam because the nine processes of bhakti are detailed. But Prabhupada summarizes, <clears throat> a pure devotee is interested in devotional service only, not in material affairs. doesn't mean they don't do things that are of this world, but their interest is how to connect that thing that I do in this world with service to Krishna. Nothing separate. Everything connected. To execute devotional service, one should always engage in hearing and chanting about Krishna or Lord Vishnu. This is the symptom of pure devotional service. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, recognize this is Bilva Mangala Thakur reciting songs about Krishna. And who is attracted? Krishna. He would sit with a nice smile, such a nice smile, appreciating the bhakti of Bilvamangala Thakur. The iti pungsarpita Vishnu, that's the second line of that verse. The word pungsa means all living entities. Who is eligible for devotional service? All living entities. Not just men, not just brahmanas. All living entities. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expanded beyond the human form of life. And to a small extent, we can do that too. You can... I was visiting a home one time during, Christmas, during winter, and I noticed right outside their window, because it was snow everywhere, there were footprints of squirrels. And I asked, what's this? I said, oh, every day when we make our offering to our deity, we put some almonds and some nuts that are offered to the deity just outside the door on the balcony. And, this, and they said, you can set your clock 
to the exact time that quarrels come to take their morning breakfast. Right on time. And I, so I watched, and sure enough, really regulated squirrels. <laughs> Connected with deity worship. And it was Krishna Prashadam. So that's one of the duties of householders. Not just to feed squirrels, but to consider whatever gift Krishna has given, how can it be shared with others? The best of all gifts is the gift of transcendental knowledge. But this gift of Krishna Prashadam is another very natural gift, far more so than just philanthropy and altruism and giving to the Red Cross or something like that. Some charity work. The, Krishna, the, give, the gift of Krishna consciousness can go to other living entities and then those other living entities are taking prasadam. And the, the tree that produced the almonds is getting some spiritual benefit because you offered the almonds to Krishna and so forth. Uh, you know, the human form of life can do those things and others that aren't in the human form of life can get spiritual benefit if the human form of life is engaged properly. So the gift of transcendental knowledge is really important. Now, receiving the gift properly is also really important. We've, we've been given it, we received it to some degree, and how completely we rece have received that knowledge is really important because then we're more capable of giving it unrestrictedly, transparently, and so forth. Bhagavatyada, that's another phrase in this second line. Bhagavatyada, one must directly offer everything to Vishnu, Prabhupada explains. Fruitive workers first perform some pious activity and then formally or officially offer the results to Vishnu, karma yoga. The real devotee, however, first offers his surrender to Krishna with body, mind, and words, and then uses his body, mind, and words for service to Krishna, as Krishna desires. Sometimes in Bhagavad Gita discussion groups, there's this question, what's the distinction between karma yoga, bhakti yoga? Here it is. There's, there are other distinctions, but here's a really essential one. One of the motivations, one of the, one of the primary motivations of those who are engaged in karma yoga is they don't want the implication of karma, even good karma from doing pious activity. And so they do the pious activity and then they offer the result to Vishnu because they don't want implication in karma. So it leads to liberation, but it doesn't lead to Krishna Loka. On the other hand, the subset, bhakti includes karma yoga plus. Yes? And what's that plus? Even before doing the activity, Dedicate oneself, body, mind, and words to service of Krishna, and then the rest follows the same. Everything belongs to Krishna. Small point, but quite major point. One should act for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu, not for the satisfaction of his own senses. That is the meaning of the word adha. Bhagavati Adha. So in his purport, Prabhupada is just expanding this really important verse. Now, I didn't take the time to go through the nine processes of bhakti. It's just describing principles of bhakti. Bhagavati Adha. For the satisfaction of Vishnu or Krishna directly. Now, directly doesn't mean we bypass the spiritual master or disciplic succession, we just go to Krishna directly. It means rather than this indirect method like karma yoga, 
That's what it means. Krishna is to be pleased. And emphasizing this, in Gopal, Tapani Upanishad, the definition of bhakti is the same thing. Rupa Goswami expresses it. It's exclusive. Bhakti is exclusive. Krishna only. Not Hinduism. Om Jai Jagadisha Hare. This one, that one, that one, that one, this one. Om Jai Jagadisha Hare. He's last in line. But Krishna only. And because you give to Krishna only, it's like you put water on the root of the tree or you put food in the stomach and it goes to all the parts of the tree or all the limbs of the body. That's the system. And there's faith in that system. And one who follows that system with faith, that's bhakti. Bhagavatya da. If a devotee performs only one of these nine without deviation, he can attain the mercy of Krishna. You want the mercy of Krishna? So engage in any one of the nine processes without deviation or any combination of them or all of them, whatever your heart's desire. When a devotee executes any one of the nine processes, this is sufficient, semicolon, the other eight processes are included. Now, combine different of the nine, that's very nice, one supports the other. And of all of them, this hearing and chanting most important. In, in Jiva Goswami's Bhakti Sandarbha, he emphasizes chanting. Like a whole long section, important section, because this is the teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu through Srimad Bhagavatam, but when you're chanting, you're hearing. And if you're, if you're doing deity worship, you should be chanting as part of deity worship. And you're doing praying. There should be hearing and chanting, because then it, that precedes the prayer. Etc. So he goes to this really elaborate explanation with scriptural references and says the essence is chanting. Similar discussion in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Sarva Bhavabhattacharya asked about Chaitanya of all the beneficial things mentioned in the scriptures that living entities are recommended to. Is there one thing that's most important? Yes. Chanting the holy name. Chanting specifically the name because within the name is everything. And then you can chant scripture, but that's just unpacking part of what's everything. So we do both. Not one or the other, we do both. end. So that concludes, um, depending on how our question and answer session goes, that com concludes the, the second, excuse me, the third instruction section. So the third one is, what's the best thing? It's devotional service, nine processes. The one prior to that how did you learn all of this? How did your consciousness get contaminated? Who's, who's the enemy that polluted you? And super soul. <laughs> the same person that's giving you your friends and enemy consciousness is giving me Krishna consciousness. That's where I got it. And my attraction for Krishna is natural, like... Iron to a magnet. And persons like you, who are averse to Krishna, super soul is covered, you can't see anything. Anything that's spiritual, you can't see. You see it as, as something material, like you're seeing me. But I'm very somehow blessed 
because I'm devoted to, to Vishnu, he's blessed me with this intelligence to not see friend and enemy, to be able to see super soul, to be able to see that which is spiritual as spiritual. And we both have the same master. He's actually your best friend, although you see him as enemy, Vishnu. And then we already re reviewed the very first instruction, Hranyakashipu asking what's the best thing you've learned. So let's see if there's any discussion. Now I've been told there's a program that's been scheduled and publicized here. There's going to be a bhajan group coming in. Is that today? 11.30. So we have some time before the bhajan group comes. Have a half an hour. And if there's no questions, I'll go on to the next section. Questions? Yes. Here's the microphone. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I really like the word you told uh, how Hiranyakashipu was unnaturally unattracted to Krishna. Mm. So, here if you see like uh, compare Prahlad and Hiranyakashipu, so the main difference you see is uh, Narada Maharshi's mercy upon Prahlad, that is the main cause of Prahlad's bhakti to towards Krishna. Okay, but that 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 part I understand that it goes very well with the either chaya, like the uh, sweetful will of the pure devotees of the Lord to bestow bhakti upon. Um, jiva. But at the same time, when we told the words from 728 Bhagavad Gita, it says the Jivas who acted piously in the previous lives get bhakti. How, how we could understand that? Well, two things. I'm, I'm not sure. What, one thing is I'm not sure what your question is, but uh, Narada was the agent of bhakti or the deliverer of bhakti for Prahlad and now Prahlad is carrying bhakti and he could be the agent for changing the heart of anyone Nishringadeva or anyone any jiva so the opportunity is the same one pure devotee, another pure devotee, one one of the twelve Mahajans and another one of the twelve Mahajans. It's not like ordinary run-of-the-mill devotee or something. They're very, very specially qualified. So he has that capacity. He has the capacity to do that with his classmates, and they become devotees. But they're born sons of demons, so that it's not like high birth because of lots of piety and no impiety they took that birth because of the opposite so bhakti has the power of overcoming those now if I've understood your question correctly this yesham tvantikatam papam that verse it can the, the, there's the elevator method and the staircase method like Jagai and Madhai. You're familiar, right? Sinful. Rindavan Das Thakur goes on and on and on about all their sinful activities and no sin mountains, nothing they didn't do, and, you know, horrible. Very, very sinful. And pious activities? Eh. So that precondition isn't met which I think is what your question is. But because of the mercy of Lord Nityananda and then in turn the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, 
It was instant turnaround. And within the prayers of Prahlad, and we'll find it again in chapter 10, no material pre-qualification, which sounds like contradicting 720 Bhagavad Gita. But Bhakti has the process to change all that. Or let's take another example, Prabhupada coming to the West. And he said, these young Western boys and girls, their lives were simply made up of sinful activity. And now they've given it up. How is that possible? Because now they have a higher taste. And how they get that? Well, it didn't, the higher taste didn't come like with Jagai Madhai. It came more gradually, but it came by the same principle from a proper source. Prabhupada's in, as an instrument in one case and Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya in the other case. But it's descending mercy. And it still requires saying yes. It's not like you get cleansed and you don't have to say yes. <laughs> the, 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 the power of bhakti has that power to immediately, at once, create that piety, no impiety situation. It's a free will choice. The, it's, the opportunity is there through the bhakti process. And all one has to do is say yes instead of no or maybe or whatever else one might say. Well, 5%. The potency is there within bhakti to create that first part of the precondition in chapter 7, verse 20. Okay? Okay, should I move on to the next section? You have something? You too have something. Um, <coughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, one of the principles that uh, Prahlad Maharaj emphasizes is to not see people in terms of friend and enemy and see everybody as a devotee of Lord Krishna, as a servant of Lord Krishna. Yeah. How do we still uphold that principle when it comes to people that are narcissists, that are abusive, that f try to harm others in, in whatever way possible, and especially when it comes to those that commit horrific acts of violence? How do we still uphold that principle that everybody is the servant of Lord Krishna? Okay. It's right in issue Upanishad stated really briefly. They're serving unfavorably. Supposing there's a mother and father, and they have a number of children, and one child amongst the many children is naughty, still their child. So see them as children of Krishna, even the ones that do harmful things to other people. They're meant for favorable service to Krishna, and they're serving unfavorably. Now there's causes for their serving unfavorably, and you can list what those causes are, but they're reaping the fruit of their past free will choices, and therefore they're acting unfavorably as the, co you know, the, the consequence of previous free will choices. And they're in the moment making choices they don't have to make, the negative ones they don't have to make, they could choose positive ones instead. So making present choices that are creating future bondage for themselves. But the soul is independent of those choices, karma. 
but their service is unfavorable, quite in, in, in the reference to what you're saying, quite unfavorable. You could go stronger and unacceptable. <laughs> you can go f further and say, you know, criminal. But they're servants of Krishna too. Unfavorable. Let's, let's, let's go back, one step back from their servants of Krishna to the step that says their spirit soul. They're certainly spirit soul. Then go the next, go back again, this step further. They're constitutionally souls are eternal servants of Krishna. Eternally, even the ones that you know do bad things, eternally servants of Krishna, serving unfavorably. So what what's what's the cause? It's ignorance. Or you can say it's the consequence of their past free will choices, which is ignorance, if it's, you know, on the dark side. So removal of ignorance is the solution. And it's not just, you know, give them a elementary, and media, whatever it's called, middle school and high school education, and they'll become, they'll stop being bad people. Not just that education, that removal of ignorance. No harm with that, but it's not at all sufficient. And so how do you give people spiritual? That's the, the, the question of the whole Bhagavatam. One of, the, one of the six questions of the whole Bhagavatam is how to eradicate the darkness of Kali Yuga, the light of the Bhagavat. And that's the answer given by Sutta Goswami. That's the conclusion given by Vyas. That's the conclusion of us. Now, to give people Shumad Bhagavatam, we may have to do other things, all kinds of other things. But that's the light. The goal is to bring that light into that place of darkness, is to get people to say yes to the, the Bhagavat and its message and changing the lifestyle from ignorant one to illuminated one. But that's the, that's the medicine, that's the cure. So now back to your question. How do you see them? these people that are mean and harmful and hurting others as devotees of Krishna. See them as spirit soul. The constitutional position of the soul is Krishna's servant. They're just serving unfavorably due to ignorance, due to being contaminated. So therefore this language in this that was just covered, purification is needed. And then, okay, how to do that? In this age of Kali, it starts with chanting. It may start with prashada before chanting. But, you know, it starts with chanting. <laughs> That's where we want to go. And, and, and take people with us. It's not pushing, it's, it's medicine. Maharaj, this is a question from Snehavali Mataji from oh, Seattle. okay. And she has a question that I think it was regarding the morning lecture you gave. Okay. The higher principle is that Krishna should be pleased. Yeah. But suppose we think a devotee, or not a devotee, like a person is offensive towards Krishna or the devotees. Is it okay to engage that person in service, if we engaging him in service, or he doing service is leading to he making offenses? Depends. You know, it depends. That's like we go on Harinam Sankirtan, we're engaging people in Krishna service. And some people are offensive. We engage them in service. You know, we may consider we may give other considerations. We may not engage in other kinds of service. We may not engage them in deity worship. <laughs> we may, you know, it depends. It depends. It depends. The answer is it depends. So we don't consider the person as you're offensive to the Supreme? Well, we, we have our intelligence that's making distinction. This may be Offensive. Now, what's the best way to engage this offensive person? And maybe just keep a distance from them and pray for them. But, you know, it depends on the person and, and 
what our own capacity depends Now we have 15 minutes, and I, I guess we could end early, or I could launch into the next section, or just have kirtan. Yes, question over here. Just speak right in. Just, you got it. Sound? Here comes mic number two. Is it good? Can we have mic number two? Ah. This is something I heard from you last week. Um, uh, last week? Yes, Maharaj. Oh. Um, you said that one point, uh, like uh, sometimes mercy can be bounced back as well. So could you, I was just wondering, like uh, sometimes we are, mercy is always merciful, but sometimes it will bounce back. We cannot receive the mercy which is flowing. You know? Are you speaking of your being given some mercy and it bounces back or you're trying to extend something that looks like mercy and it bounces back or what are you asking yeah i'm what i'm asking is sometimes it wonders me that oh mercy is always merciful like and able to receive but there are some same situations some people are so merciful they want to give mercy but because we we also can put filter or something we can bounce we it. or somebody else be really i'm not clear i hope you're clear um, let me put this in order. So, is that some mercy will bounce back? Mercy bounces back. Yeah. Could you explain what you mean by that? Mercy bounces back. It's not received. Yes, it's not received. The um, a mercy signal is sent. The person doesn't receive it. Yes. That's the bouncing back of mercy. Yes. Okay. That. That's actually this possible. Like some, uh, what I was thinking that it's always you don't receive it. Prahlad is giving mercy to his teachers and to Hiranyakashipu. It's not going in. They become angry. Does that answer your question? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. okay. Okay, I think we won't go further. Just end a little early, and somebody wants to lead Kirtan, please do so. And we'll meet again. What time? Five thirty? Six thirty? Six thirty? Six thirty. Shri Prabhupada Ki Day.